Welcome to the Dr. Doug Show, where I bring together two critical components of self-mastery, health span and mindset. The topics presented here will help you improve both your body and your mind and to help you to live better longer. No matter how much I encourage people to optimize their sleep, I see very little change in behavior until people either realize how much risk there is associated with sleep deprivation or how much better they feel when they actually start sleeping well. Sometimes to get someone to feel the difference, we need to scare them a little bit with some statistics. So take a listen to these statistics and keep in mind that usually short sleep is considered less than seven hours, sometimes six, but that's actually more like eight hours of laying in bed asleep. When I'm done telling you about the scary statistics, I'm gonna give you three of our best tips and tricks around how to get the best sleep. So stick around until the end and we're gonna give you some of the secrets that we tell our patients when seeking to optimize their sleep and performance. Three, two, one. There's a growing body of research that underscores a chilling link between sleep deprivation and an increased risk of dementia. A study that was recently published in the journal Nature Communications found that individuals who consistently slept less than six hours per night in their 50s and 60s were 30% more likely to develop dementia later in life compared to those who slept for the recommended seven hours, which is still pretty short. Sleep is crucial for the brain to clear out beta amyloid and other toxins that build up through the brain uh, throughout the day, just throughout everyday life. That beta amyloid is the toxin that is known to be associated with Alzheimer's disease and clearing up both beta amyloid as well as other things that build up throughout the day are critical for continuing to improve our brain function and minimize deterioration over time. We see this all the time in people who are let's call it very aggressive with their schedule. They want to minimize their sleep in order to be as productive as possible. And there are some well-known celebrities um, and authorities in the past who have prided themselves on how little they sleep and saying that they'll sleep when they're dead. Unfortunately, it's not surprising that a lot of these celebrities now also have dementia. It's easy to forget how important sleep is because we don't necessarily feel any immediate reward for sleeping the appropriate amount of time. Most people don't recognize how good sleep feels. And we're so wrapped up in our immediate to-do list and the tasks that are required of us that we're very quick to sacrifice sleep because we don't really do a good job of understanding the implications of long-term risk. Okay, so if dementia is not a big enough deal for you, um, and I think it is, and it should be, and it's certainly worth preventing, but for those that aren't concerned about Alzheimer's, maybe some of the other chronic diseases that cause death and disability might interest you. So the uh, CDC points out that adults who sleep less than seven hours each night are more likely to report one of or multiple of 10 chronic health conditions, including a history of heart attack, asthma, and depression, and more. Sleep deprivation can lead to issues like impaired glucose metabolism, which leads to diabetes, increased blood pressure, which can lead to an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. All of these things are precursors to all of the major chronic diseases, the four horsemen that we talk about wanting to prevent so that we can live our best lives, live better, longer. I know personally that if I've had a bad night of sleep from travel or let's say a sick child the next day, I always feel like I have this kind of like buzz feeling. I'm not talking about a subtle buzz from something like alcohol. I'm talking about the feeling of just being a little bit uh, off, you know, having that feeling like I'm a little bit on fire, that I'm a little bit inflamed. I also noticed that this is kind of what drives me to have an increase in hunger, an increase in cravings for carbohydrates, and this has been well proven in the literature. So if I have more than one night in a row of bad sleep, then I notice that these behaviors that are out of control or getting out of control are generally cascading. One of the challenges in the search for longevity and health span, and really for anything that we want to do to improve our health, we need to avoid those things that cause a risk of death, right? And so it's interesting that when you look at studies on sleep and death, you can actually see that sleep, short sleep rather, is actually linked to or associated with uh, an increased risk of death. And in fact, there was a study that showed a 12% increased risk of death in those that had short sleep. So this was a, a study of uh, meta-analysis of 16 studies in over a million people. And we continue to see this in both small studies and large studies that the link between sleep deprivation 
and some kind of bad outcome is very clear. So while the exact mechanism is not clear, um, there seems to be this hypothesis that sleep deprivation will weaken your immune system. Uh, it'll alter me metabolic functions and increase susceptibility to various diseases. The thing is, is uh, if it doesn't kill you and it doesn't change your immune system or change the way that you live your daily life, it might actually change the way that you think about your life. So the psychological ramifications of sleep deprivation are really disturbing. There was a study in JAMA Psychiatry that found that individuals with insomnia were twice as likely to develop depression as those without sleep issues. It's hard to know here what's the chicken or the egg, but short sleep is definitely associated with an increase in anxiety, mood swings, impaired emotional regulation, and unfortunately, it doesn't matter whether or not sleep is the precursor to psychiatric disease or vice versa. The cycle starts, and once it starts, it's really difficult to break because people that struggle with insomnia are going to continue to have issues with psychiatric illness if they are uh, predisposed to those things, and that's, that starts. So then how do you break out of that cycle? Because people that are struggling with anxiety and depression are going to have a harder time generally sleeping. So that's a really tough one to get out of once it starts. Um, all right, then what, let's talk about body weight. So there is an association between sleep deprivation and obesity, and it's grounded in numerous studies. Uh, there was a, a meta-analysis that I looked up in, uh, it was published in the journal Sleep, and it revealed that short sleep duration increases the likelihood of obesity in adults by 55%. Sleep deprivation disrupts the balance of hunger-regulating hormones like ghrelin and leptin, and it leads to an increase in appetite and calorie intake, like I mentioned earlier. Moreover, the fatigue induced by inadequate sleep may actually deter physical activity. You're tired. The contributing weight gain that can come as a result of that, again, leads to these, these spiraling, uh, downward spirals of behavior, uh, poor sleep, poor activity, poor sleep, poor behavior, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many studies on this topic, and it's very clear that short sleep will have an impact on weight, and it makes it difficult to lose weight once the weight starts to come on. Um, and it can definitely have an impact on maintaining weight loss, which is really where we shine as a program. There are so many mechanisms that support the principles that include things like an increase in cortisol, uh, cortisol dysregulation, dysregulation of other hormones like uh, greptin and leptin, like I mentioned earlier, um, dysfunctional immune system, uh, dysfunctional sex hormones, uh, and it, on and on and on. So it's amazing when you start looking at the research around sleep, that sleep deprivation really will impact everything negatively and it just gets worse over time. So before I get to our three top fixes for sleep issues. If you um, have it already and you are interested in learning more about people that are kind of in this same space as you, if you're listening to this, people that want to learn about all the tips and tricks uh, that people are using to help to live better longer, consider joining our HealthSpan Nation. This is where myself and my team members uh, to Optimal Human Health meet weekly with people to answer Q and A's, talk about new products, new supplements, peptides, hormone questions. Uh, we generally will have a kind of a, um, uh, a topic led discussion. Uh, sometimes we'll have guests, but this is where all of our, uh, discount codes and resources for people that want to live this type of lifestyle, uh, live. This is an inexpensive, uh, uh, monthly membership. So I would encourage you to check that out. You can go to drdouglucas.com um, and you can learn more about that as well as all of our other programs. Let's get on to how to improve your sleep in three steps. Number one thing is schedule it. For me, I don't know about you, but for me, if I don't schedule it, it doesn't happen. So I very intentionally and very aggressively protect my eight to nine hour window for sleep. I make it as consistent as possible, whether it's a weekday or a weekend, it doesn't matter. Consider what we call the social jet lag of swinging back and forth between weekday and weekend schedules. If you even move it more than an hour, it's like literally traveling time zone. So you need to be absolutely consistent with your schedule. And the goal is to wake up in the morning without an alarm clock, bright eyed and bushy tail. All right. So the next one, number two is to create a sleep chamber. I call it a sleep chamber and not a bedroom because you need to consider that this thing is a sleep chamber. Where you sleep is almost as important as how much you sleep, and it plays a massive role in sleep quality. So I discuss this with our patients all the time because I see so many people that complain of dysfunctional sleep 
only to then talk about the fact that they have dogs in their bed, they have a TV on, they've got their phone in their hand, and just like so many distractions that keep them from getting good sleep. So here's what I recommend. Number one, make your room as cold as you can tolerate. And for many couples, this will be a challenge. You may find that one person prefers or can't tolerate the cold temperature that the other one can. For the sake of your relationship, find a compromise. For me and my wife, this is around 71 degrees. I've tried to push it colder. She wants to have it warmer, but most of our patients prefer it to be much colder in the kind of upper to mid 60s. All right, so number two is you need your room to be as dark as it can be. This includes obvious things like turning off overhead lamps uh, or overhead lights rather, uh, lamps, anything that can make a significant amount of light. But frequently this also requires blocking out either street lights, ambient light from outside, potentially even moonlight. And this is assuming you're sleeping through the night, um, which I strongly recommend. But even once you've done that within the room itself, I recommend covering any sort of bright or really honestly, any LEDs at all. Those little LED lights on electronics, which really shouldn't be in your room anyway, but all those little LED lights can have a significant impact on your brain. Your eyes pick them up so clearly and they are, there are some, um, little red dots that we'll actually have in our, um, uh, resource list, but these little red dots that you can put on there that will change uh, and block out all of the, the blue light of those things, or you can just put tape over it if you want to be simple. Um, and then lastly, and this is a tough one for most of our patients, but you really need to only perform the critical activities of a sleep chamber in the sleep chamber. So what that means is that your bedroom or your sleep chamber is really just for sleep and for sex. There should be no working no watching TV, no watching movies, no scrolling on your phone or anything else in bed. Your brain gets used to the activities and the, the, the associated areas or locations that you're doing those activities. Think about it like this. You notice how you feel when you walk into your office, right? If you have an office. Um, I remember how I used to feel when I would walk into the operating room and it's such a different feeling than when I walk into my bedroom. So remember that your sleep chamber should be dark it should be cold and it should be used only for sleep so that your brain gets used to that or for sex, which also can be strongly associated with sleep. So the third thing is to prepare yourself for sleep. So when it comes to getting ready for bed, we have to think about it um, and really prepare for it starting earlier in the day. I mean, we're talking really early in the day. So I like to consider something that I learned from uh, from Craig Ballantyne, uh, who is a fantastic person to follow on social media if you uh, don't follow him from a behavioral perspective. And so he has what he calls the, the 10 3 2, 1 rule. And so uh, the 10 3 2, 1 rule goes like this. No caffeine 10 hours before bedtime. So now you're already thinking about bedtime, essentially like starting in the morning, right? <laughs> No food three hours before bedtime. No work two hours before bed. No screens one hour before bed. For most people, this is a really good starting point because for most people, they are not already doing this. I find that in my optimized patient population, though, they really probably are doing this. So then we need to add other uh, tips and tricks. So some popular ones that you may want to consider might be taking a warm shower right before bed, which actually has the impact of your body of cooling off your core body temp and actually helping to relax. I find that other activities that improve anxiety and reduce stress are wonderful in a bedtime routine. So this could include things like meditation, although I don't personally like to meditate before I fall asleep because I would fall asleep meditating. Um, journaling can be really helpful, breath work, prayer, basically anything that helps you to de-stress and reduce the impact of social pressure on you that build, builds up throughout the day. It's really helpful for those that struggle with that 2 to 3 a.m. wake up. And that's a conversation for another day as far as troubleshooting sleep. But if you have that 2 to 3 a.m. wake up, it's likely related to some kind of stress throughout the day. All right. So I hope that was helpful. Um, in conclusion, the statistics around sleep deprivation are not only just a little bit scary, but I hope you consider them a wake-up call that you need to prioritize sleep as an essential component of health. The pervasive impacts of sleep loss on cognitive decline, chronic diseases, overall mortality, psychiatric health, obesity, et cetera, it really underscores the imperative to address sleep deprivation as not only something that I talk to my patients about, but really as a public health issue. I would love to implement strategies. I would love for you to implement strategies like establishing consistent sleep routines, creating a conducive, we'll call it sleep environment, 
raising awareness for yourself and for others about the importance of sleep and how that can pave the way towards mitigating some of the scary consequences of sleep deprivation. Sleep is an activity that has been maintained from species to species and generation to generation for millions of years. If it weren't important, we would have gotten rid of it a long time ago. Proper sleep hygiene and recognizing what your starting point is, is critical to help with sleep optimization. We'll do another podcast on sleep trackers and troubleshooting sleep, et cetera. But ultimately at this point, I just want you to understand how critical sleep is, how risky short sleep is, and that on an optimization journey, really sleep is probably the number one thing we can do. So that's it. Remember my friends that we are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Do not be afraid to be extraordinary because that's what it takes. If you haven't already, if you're on YouTube, please click the subscribe button. That will really help us to bring this information and content to more people. Uh, if you're on a podcast platform, leaving a review, will do the same thing. Again, I mentioned the HealthSpan Nation before. This is where you're going to see the resources, the red dots I talked about, discounts that we provide for our listeners, uh, and of course, your ability to ask us a Q&A on a weekly basis. So if you are interested in living your optimal life, the HealthSpan Nation is the way that we are helping more people to do that. So please join us there. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this podcast and video. I'll see you next time. Disclaimer. This presentation is for general informational purposes only, does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this presentation are at the user's own risk. The content in this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. See you next time.